and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that sometimes just needs a little nudge. Case in point, not too terribly long ago, I got a note from a viewer regarding the venerable Seattle-based video reissue company, Something Weird Video. And this sent me digging through my couple of boxes of so-called cult VHS and beta and laser discs, looking for any Something Weird titles that I happen to have. Then uh, something kind of occurred to me as I was digging through these boxes. I was running into names like Rhino from back when they were still independent, and Wizard Video, and Lightning Video, and Interglobal, and on and on. And it hit me that I've been running into these companies for years and never really thought much about them. So, you know, maybe it's time to take a little look back. So with that, today I want to launch a hopefully occasionally recurring project in which we take a look back at some of those usually more VHS-centric distribution companies. So for this first installment, I want to take a look at the most famous of the reissue companies. And those would be Rhino, <laughs> sorry Cassandra, as well as, as heavily implied, Something Weird Video. I guess the best way you could describe Something Weird founder Mike Vrainy would be as a punk rock entrepreneur. Starting out by reselling comic books in high school, Vrainy dropped out to become a film projectionist at the Sultan Theater in Seattle, which specialized in uh, adult films. During this time, Vrainy began collecting pretty much any old discarded film he could find. This got somewhat derailed around 1979, when Vrainy became a partner in Modern Productions, who just took on the lease for the Showbox Theater a 1,500-seat concert venue, which was soon relaunched as a punk-oriented venue. From there, Vrainy took on managerial duties for a few bands, including the... Dead Kennedys. Impressive. During this time, often while on the road with his bands, Vrainy's film collection began expanding faster than ever, and ultimately, he decided he was more interested in film than the music business. In 1988, Vrainy opted to start over as a video bootlegger, largely of more obscure movies he'd taped off the TV. However, among the most popular of Vrainy's offerings were a selection of sexploitation films from the 1930s through 60s from his personal film collection. These particular films provided the launching point for Something Weird Video, founded in 1990 and named after the 1967 Herschel Gordon Lewis film. By 1992, Something Weird had built up a following by, instead of trying to get its product into traditional video stores, getting it into comic book shops, and not to mention doing the good old mail order thing, usually advertising through cult film fanzines. However, going back to Vrainy's initial video bootlegging business, he was a frequent recipient of cease and desist orders. Funnily enough, it was one of those jilted copyright holders that helped turn something weird legit. One day, producer David F. Friedman, of Ilsa She-Wolf of the SS infamy, called Vrainy to chew him out over something weird's releases of some of his films. Vrainy was able to talk Friedman out of suing by negotiating a royalty with him, plus doing a test run of some of his other films. When Vrainy sent Friedman his first royalty check, which turned out to be far larger than he'd expected, Friedman not only gave Vrainy full access to his entire filmography, 
but also introduced him to his surviving contemporaries slash compatriots, guys like Harry Novak and the aforementioned Herschel Gordon Lewis, to other filmmakers that Something Weird had already been distributing. These relationships would stand as long as each person was still alive, and beyond. Let's get together and meet that very delightful, that sultry siren of the Southland, very lovely Betty Page. Speaking of legal woes, in 1994, Something Weird was faced with its greatest legal challenge. Weirdly enough, this time not over film rights. Former pinup model Betty Page, at the behest of her attorney, sued Something Weird over the use of a drawing of her likeness to promote a pair of Page's films that Something Weird had been distributing. Of course, public domain distributors had been doing such things for their own artwork for years with little opposition. Read the pertinent Betty Page films had indeed fallen into the public domain. Unsurprisingly, in September of 1996, the suit was dismissed, with something weird being, operative word, awarded over $82,000 in legal fees that had been built up over the previous two years, leaving the already borderline destitute Page broke. Twice as unsurprisingly, Page promptly fired her attorney. Stepping back to 1994, or 92 depending on your source, Vrainy and David F. Friedman paid a visit to the abandoned Movie Lab film processing building in New York City. Movie Lab had been out of business for at least a few years by this point. Like clockwork, the building was loaded with prints of obscure and often outright unreleased films. Two weeks later, Vrainy and filmmaker Frank Hennenlauter of Basket Case and Frankenhooker Infamy paid another visit to Movie Lab. Now, the building was actually still active in spots and maintained a custodial staff. The custodians knew that the films were going to be thrown out whenever the new tenants came in. As it turned out, the head custodian had been quietly selling some of the abandoned films to collectors for some time. So, naturally, Vrainy and Hennenlauter offered the head custodian $5,000 for as many films as they could cram into their rented truck. The two were given free reign for three days to clear out whatever they wanted. In the end, they walked away with complete prints of somewhere between 130 and 160 movies. Several years later, before some new tenants finally moved in, Vrainy acquired the remaining films. In 1999, with the help of Frank Hennenlauter, Something Weird inked an apparently sweetheart deal with Image Entertainment, formerly best known for their Laserdisc distribution, to bring Something Weird into the DVD age. Over the course of their association, Image distributed to the tune of 200 of their titles, at long last two mainstream video and or record stores like Tower and Suncoast, at least until they went under. In all reality, the deal between Something Weird and Image ended in 2007. However, Image has since kept most of the Something Weird titles by arrangement in print and will remain so until 2020. Having said that, around the time the initial deal with Image ended, seeing the end of the road for the likes of Tower Records looming, Something Weird became one of the first companies to begin selling downloadable and DVD-R on-demand copies of almost their entire back catalog. In August of 2012, founder Mike Vrainy was diagnosed with lung cancer. Vrainy and his wife, Lisa Petrucci, were able to keep the diagnosis and treatments a secret from all but their closest friends and family. 
Nevertheless, on January 2nd, 2014, Mike Vrainy died at the age of 56. Mike's final request to his wife was to liquidate Something Weird's assets. However, Lisa couldn't bring herself to do that and has since assumed leadership of the company. Since Mike's passing, Something Weird has entered deals with the Alamo Drafthouse-run Agfa, Severin Films, and Kino Lorber, among others, to co-produce two- and 4K restorations of some of Something Weird's back catalog. They've also since dipped their toes into rounding up and reissuing some of the more notable songs and score pieces that have appeared in their films. As of this episode, Petrucci has mentioned the possibility of branching out into books on oddball cinema. While today's other company doesn't carry the same hipster cachet that something weird does, I think I can safely say that they were the gateway for a lot of us, myself included, into the world of oddball cultural ephemera. And, of course, that would be Rhino. Uh, yeah, the record label. They also did video for about 20 years. And, uh, hell, Rhino was the first reissue company that I ever bought from uh, video and music. And, indeed, this Monkees tape here is one of those initial tapes that I bought back in 1997, 98 at the latest. And where else, pray tell, were you ever going to find a documentary on the Turtles? I think we're all at least somewhat familiar with Rhino, the record label, but perhaps not so much Rhino Home Video. Nonetheless, here's a little backstory on everything. In October of 1973, entrepreneur Richard Foose opened Rhino Records, an actual record store on Westwood Boulevard in Los Angeles. Rhino Records built its reputation on being an intentionally offbeat alternative to the likes of Tower Records, featuring a selection of oddball, uncommercial albums, imports, and a massive backstock of used, ultra-cheap Herb Alpert albums, due to their policy of buying any used record offered to them. Go to Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard! They have nice people there! Starting in 1975, Rhino began issuing their own records. While none were huge, things were successful enough that by mid-1978, Foos and store manager Harold Bronson, hired in 1974, were encouraged enough to try and get some of their largely unavailable favorite classic rock, pop, and R&B records licensed and reissued. Which they did, and it proved to be a goldmine for Rhino. The logical next step was to branch out into home video. After a false start in 1984 with Andy Kaufman's My Breakfast with Blossie, a parody of the 1981 art house hit My Dinner with Andre, Rhino decided to run with the nostalgic bent that was fueling their record sales. Rockabilly musician and one-time Rhino Records artist, and not to mention co-director of My Breakfast with Blasi, Johnny Legend was brought on to piece together some compilations of, preferably public domain, movie trailers and nostalgic clips. Legend's first submission to Rhino, a B-movie trailer compilation entitled Sleaze Mania, was released in the spring of 1985. Sleaze Mania proved to be a relative success for Rhino, in that, while it wasn't a huge seller, it turned a profit, in thanks to its low production costs. A couple of Sleaze Mania sequels and a compilation of vintage sex ed films followed, with diminishing returns. As an amusing side note, Johnny Legend later played a role at Something Weird Video, with his untamed video line of tapes. 
From here, Richard Foos assumed responsibility for Rhino's fledgling video division. Their first new project came in tandem with IRS Records, home of the Go-Go's, Wall of Voodoo, and a few others. IRS had already tried their hand at home video as a means of releasing some of their artists' music videos, but the endeavor was quickly squashed due to some rather shady investors. In 1987, the IRS Rhino partnership resulted in a pair of best of videos of MTV's alternative rock show, The Cutting Edge, with Peter Zaremba. The costs of the videos wound up being too expensive to make things worthwhile for either party, and the two wound up going their separate ways. Facing the reality that their oddball clip shows weren't going to bring them much success, Rhino largely spent the late 80s and early 90s releasing new and existing rock documentaries and often satirical novelty videos. Both brought them critical acclaim, but middling sales. In 1990, in an effort at merging their taste for nostalgia and desire for relevance, Rhino brought on Cassandra Peterson, aka Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, to put together a series of home video versions of her recently ended Elvira's Movie Macabre series, here retitled Midnight Madness. If nothing else, the Midnight Madness releases proved that Rhino was on the right track. As such, Rhino embarked on a series of releases meant to straddle the line between general nostalgia and oddball ephemera. The result was a mishmash of cult-slash-semi-classic TV shows, concert and music video compilations of mostly 50s, 60s, and 70s bands and artists, and a sampling of the tamer end of exploitation cinema, like Ed Wood's friendlier sci-fi and horror fair. Two souls stranded in a barren wasteland. Of Rhino, let me see. In 1992, Warner Brothers bought 50% interest in Rhino. However, this proved to be of no use to Rhino Home Video, as Warners figured that anything they had the rights to that had any possibility of selling well could just be issued by Warner Home Video. However, Rhino finally belatedly hit pay dirt in 1995 with the release of a 21-tape set of the complete Monkees TV series. From there, Rhino scored with releases of selected episodes of Mystery Science Theater 3000, South Park, and, once again, The Monkees. However, in 1998, Warner bought out the remaining 50% of Rhino. While Warner continued to use the Rhino home video name periodically, usually in tandem with anything oldies or classic rock related, Rhino home video was mostly left to rot. In 2005, Warner, save for a few existing titles, pulled the plug on Rhino Home Video. Rhino Records store founder Richard Foos has since gone on to form Shout Factory, another record-slash-video reissue label operating in the same spirit as the original Rhino. Well... That's it for today's archive. Join me next time, dear children, when I teach you even more about why your older siblings and your parents are so screwed up. Rhino, hey, the place to go. Rhino, hey, the place to go. Went to Moby Dis, couldn't take the risk. Went to feel the sad, but the selection there was bad. My records, 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 records,